Okay, okay, well, sorry about that, folks. Uh, some, t some technical difficulties. It's a little early in the morning here. And obviously, my machine doesn't like it. So, look, talking today about um, uh, cyber protection for industrial control systems. Um, so, really, what I want to do, do this in two stages. I'm going to uh, just go through what the, the, the sort of threat landscape and why. Uh, why uh, industrial control systems are being targeted, how they're being targeted, and then I'll I'll take you on to our solution OT Insights, which um, provides a number of uh, methods for uh, for dealing with with the challenges of cyber attack on industrial control systems. Um, I'm assuming that's going to take around about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, and then after that, we'll we'll take uh, questions. Um, so, um, and I think uh, I think there's the uh, the opportunity to to uh, tap in questions as we go along. So, okay. So, so with uh, industrial control systems, and the attacks that we're really concerned about are tar targeted cyber attacks or advanced persistent threats. So these, um, I, I, again, you're possibly aware of this, but these are not like uh, the sort of general malware attacks that you get uh, in enterprise. Um, these, you know, the ones that affect millions of machines or thousands of machines. These are very stealthy. They're, they're designed uh, specifically for um, a few verticals, some, you know, various industries, maybe sometimes particular companies within those verticals. So. An actual company would be will be targeted, and sometimes actual assets. It'll actually target a particular asset uh, owned by a particular company in a particular particular vertical. So very very stealthy. Um, when they go into a system, um, it could it could be six months, eighteen months before uh, there's any any sign of this uh, malware moving through the system before it actually takes takes an effect that actually causes something you can see. So. Very hard to detect. Uh, yeah, going on to the next slide. Uh, how prevalent are these targeted attacks? Um, again, I've got some uh, a bit of an old number there that I need to update. But uh, in 2013, uh, there was an average of 74 targeted attacks per day. Um, now that possibly doesn't sound like a lot, but it but it is when you consider how much effort goes into um, putting together one of these targeted attacks. Um, so that was 74 a day. They, they kind of split up. You, you'll actually see just that there, there's, there's some numbers from IBM. They, they reckon that the uh, the percentage of a targeted attacks has increased 110% uh, in 2016. And if you look at the the uh, pie chart there, this is this is from um, the Department of Homeland Security. You'll actually see that the uh, yeah, you know, they talked about uh, 290 incidents by sector, uh, and you'll see 59 of those were in energy, yeah, 63 in critical um, manufacturing, and 62 in comms, and a whole bunch of other things. So, uh, these, so it kind of gives you an idea of where these attacks are happening. Um, but the, but the number is increasing, and it's increasing. Uh, it's probably accelerating. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so who's doing this and what are the outcomes? Um, I, I, I guess the, uh, the, the, the the primary source of of these attacks is nation states. So you know this will this will actually be um, people like you know on 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 the on the western side you've got the USA NSA and GCHQ in the UK and um, a bunch of other countries who are very active in there. Um, you've also got um, you know, on on the other side, uh, you've got a, a whole bunch of governments who are also pumping a lot of money into developing uh, the, this malware uh, and then uh, deploying it. Um, so probably nations have, partly because of the expense of putting this together, it really is a big effort and, a cost, uh, and there's quite some cost involved. So nation states are the ones they're using. It's a way of preparing for war. Um, it's it's it's, it's, it's uh, a little bit sad but true. Um, so. The the idea is each country now is starting to look at uh, uh, putting putting malware into critical national infrastructure, so transmission systems, energy supply trains, chains, those, those sort of areas. Um, organised crime also uh, something that we'll see probably see more of. I don't think there's been any um, ransomware used against industrial control systems yet, but I think that's probably just a matter of time. 
and then you have terrorists, disgruntled employees, so employees who don't get the promotion uh, or have been asked to leave the company, again, they are a possible threat, uh, and then anarchists. Outcomes, the outcomes I show here are related to oil and gas, um, but, the, but you know, some of them are actually general to, to things like manufacturing as well and utilities. Loss of production, uh, definitely, um, definitely a, a possibility. For oil and gas, the, the absolute um, highest um, or greatest concern is injury or death, uh, probably is to most companies. Um, but yes, uh, there's also data exfiltration, uh, so stealing data not so important in an industrial control system, uh, although if someone is uh, extracting information from an industrial control system, it's probably because they're planning uh, an, a, an attack or another attack on that control system. Um, and with all of those things, you know, uh, injury, destruction of plant vessels, comes brand reputation and you know, share price depreciation. So. Uh, Quite, quite a few things, um, and look, the, the reality is, and we keep telling our customers this, that the uh, the possibility of, or the probability that you'll get a cyber attack is probably quite low uh, still, although it's increasing, but the effects of, an, of a successful cyber attack can be quite uh, quite massive. So in terms of threat, which is, you know, likelihood versus uh, effect, um, it's, still, it's still a big issue. Uh, why is the risk increasing? Um, Mainly because a lot of the technology that's now used in industrial control system is taken from um, IT systems, so it's, it's using the the, um, the same uh, the same type of equipment as used on the IT side of things, and uh, because it's cheaper, it's faster, it's evolving quicker. Uh, but with that comes all the risks associated with IT systems. Um, that and uh, uh, ready supply of hacking tools. If you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so um, you know, this, this is just a few examples of um, you know freeware, if you like, uh, that's available on the uh, on the uh, net. So you'll see there's one there called Shodan. This will tell you about all the industrial control systems that are connected to the internet, um, uh, and it's 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 a, it's a database run by a university in the UK. Um, uh, the Department of Homeland Security really wish it wasn't there, but it's there, um, and it actually lets you know if you want to hack an industrial control system, this will tell you if it's already connected to the internet and uh, the IP address. Um, there's also people who will sell hacking tools uh, for for money. Uh, some are free, some 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 do cost, and some will actually um, you know will actually give you a. Uh, a service level guarantee, and will actually help. Will actually package up a malware, uh, an exploit, uh, for you. Target it at the, uh, you, the person you want, or the company that you want them to target. Um, and if things go wrong, they'll give you a 24-hour hotline. Uh, so with all of these tools and services around, um, you know, hacking has never been so easy. Uh, also, every time there is a successful uh, attack on an industrial control system. The software that's used in that generally is available on the internet. It gets put on the internet, um, and uh, obviously that can then be leveraged by other parties for further attacks, uh, and that's what we see happening. Next slide, please. Okay, um, another reason why um, why this is all becoming more prevalent. Um, to, to successfully attack an industrial control system, bearing in mind most industrial control systems or a lot of industrial control systems already have firewalls installed. They have intruder detection systems installed, which are great, um, but then they're, they're less than effective against uh, zero-day vulnerabilities. So these are vulnerabilities um, uh, within code. So an area where a, a programmer uh, failed to do the, the correct checking whilst he was writing his code, um, and there is a there's some sort of mechanism for for attacking that software. Those vulnerabilities um, can be sold uh, to either well they can actually be sold to the company who made them. So uh, Microsoft, uh, Google, those sort of companies, Adobe will give bounties if you can bring them um, a vulnerability that you found in their code. And they'll pay you. These numbers are out of date now. They'll pay you, you know, half a million, a million dollars for some of these, um, some some of these uh, vulnerabilities. 
Um, you can also sell them to government departments and you'll actually get more money because you can sell it to multiple, multi, uh, multiple uh, uh, defense contractors, government departments. Um, so with that, there's a, there's a real incentive to, uh, to, to, to find vulnerabilities and sell vulnerabilities. Um, Stuxnet 2009, uh, we show this because A, it was a fantastic piece of malware, uh, very, very uh, ingenious. Um, but more importantly, um, when it came out in 2009, really there hadn't been much in the way of uh, attacks on the disk control system. I think the only other reported one before then was really a, 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 an attack by an employee in, in Australia, uh, Marucci Door Water Utility. Um, but Stuxnet's really put the whole, the whole concept of attacking industrial control systems on the map. So you'll see from 2009, the number of attacks or the number of vulnerabilities reported started to shoot up and that, that just continues to happen. Uh, more recently, um, we've had a, a couple of attack, attacks uh, in the Ukraine um, by Russia. Um, the first one in uh, 2015 was was interesting. Uh, so they managed to take a switch off the power to 225,000 customers uh, by by knocking off. Um, it was three three separate distribution companies. Uh, that sort of attack uh, actually used um, IT IT um, technology. So they stole VPN credentials. Um, they then uh, got remote access to the operator terminals. They used remote desktop protocol sessions, and actually it ended up acting like operators. They switched the breakers or opened up the breakers that killed the power supply, and then they ran some software on the machines that scrubbed the machines so the operators couldn't regain control. That was uh, that was interesting. It was an interesting. It was a proof of concept. The power was only off for a few hours, and that. It was really just to demonstrate uh, to the Ukrainians that this could be done. In 2016, things got a lot more serious. So this time, uh, the attack was on the, the uh, Kiev transmission grid. You can see there are half a million customers affected for a few hours. Again, it could have been a lot longer. Uh, again, the Russians were only demonstrating their capability. Um, what was really uh, different about this attack, though, it wasn't just simply using IT protocols, IT technology. It was using industrial protocols. So the industrial protocols used to um, to communicate and to control um, electrical power distribution and electrical power transmission, uh, which is these IEC 6860 101s, 104s, um, they were attacked, or they, they actually generated a, a, a created a master station within the existing systems that issued out commands to the various remote telemetry units and the uh, intelligent uh, and uh, electrical devices so the things that actually control power stations uh, sorry substations um, what they also did was they used um, um, a denial of service attack on the Siemens uh, teleprotection relays um, so again, if you have a number of substations, the, the, their actions need to be coordinated so you don't get phase differentials, and which can possibly lead to explosions, um, bad things happening. Um, and these teleprotection relays at each substation talk together to make sure everything is synchronized. Um, what they did here was they did a denial attack on the teleprotection relay, so they couldn't communicate to each other. And again, that took out the safety, uh, the safety um, activities of those units. What's really worrying is, first of all, it was very effective. It demonstrates absolute understanding of, of uh, in this case, electrical substations and uh, automation systems around those. Um, but more important than that, the software is modular. So uh, in, this, uh, in this case, uh, they were using uh, protocols that are associated with electrical distribution and transmission. Um, because of its modular nature, they could insert, or they might insert in future modules to do, to do with uh, Modbus, uh, uh, maybe Ethernet IP, and the sort of protocols which are used more in oil and gas. And depending on which industry they want to attack, they can just simply swap out those modules. So this is a, this is a game changer in terms of uh, capability, and I think we'll see a lot more uh, attacks based based on this uh, this model. Next slide, please. Yeah, so. Uh, very quickly, um, just uh, there's the, 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 uh, a PLA unit, and this is not unique 
this is not unique to uh, to China by any means. Uh, so we have uh, we have uh, Unit 61398, which is reputed to be staffed by hundreds, if not thousands, of cyber warriors who are generating malware to attack the uh, the, the the enemies or the, or the future enemies of China. Um, the UK does it. Um, GCHQ, the, uh, the 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 military here does does um, does exactly the same thing as does as do probably most countries now. Um, North Korean, they have the Lazarus Group. So there's a lot of malware. And the point here is there's a lot of malware being generated by a lot of countries now, being deployed, uh, not to actively do anything at this stage, but to be to sit inside industrial control systems for the for the moment when when they need to be activated. Um, how does the malware get into um, an industrial control system? Um, more often than not, uh, like 80%, 90% of the time, it will come in through email still, uh, so phishing attacks. Um, uh, a, a user will be tempted to open up an email, um, won't necessarily have to open up an attachment, but they'll open up an email because it sounds like it's relevant to them. Inside there, there'll be some malware. Um, it will run some code on the user machine. It will then pivot to, um, or try and talk, load itself onto the nearest server. If that server is talking to um, the management level, the level three within the process control environment, or the industrial control system, that malware will be able to get through to, say, a historian or something at that level. And then, um, again, that historian talks further down into, these are Purdue levels, by the way, so Purdue levels one and two, which the, where we actually categorize the, uh, the industrial control system. And from there, the, you know, the malware's got free reign to actually go and uh, uh, attack PLCs or DCS controllers or you know, the, the components that make up the industrial control system. One of the things you'll see there is there are firewalls uh, shown in this diagram. And uh, the reality is firewalls are extremely important still, but they're not going to stop all the, all, all the different types of malware that's out there. Um, there is, where there is a real reason for uh, you know, a server at one level to talk to a server or a workstation at another level, uh, that communication will flow, and there's a good chance the firewall won't be able to uh, recognize what, what's, what's actually happening. Uh, there has been, over the years, this idea of a get an air gap between the industrial control system and the enterprise system. So a lot of vendors, or sorry, a lot of companies have said, we don't have any problem here because we don't allow connection between the, uh, the, the process control system, the, the industrial control system, and our enterprise. The reality is that there's always been a connection. And, you know, sometimes it would be through a laptop. So an engineer would use a laptop to program an engineering workstation, um, program a, a PLC, uh, but that laptop would also be used for emails or for visiting, you know, Rockwell Automation bulletin boards or Schneider bulletin boards. So, you know, there 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 there'd be a connection for for malware to get in. And then you've also got vendors. So a lot of companies, especially oil and gas. They like vendors to have access into the networks to do remote uh, diagnostics on, on the equipment supplied by them. So if it's a generator, they want the vendor of the generator, the supplier of the generator, to be able to go in to their network to actually find out what's wrong with the generator when, thing, you know, when, when the unit fails. And again, you don't necessarily know what security uh, anti-cyber uh, defenses that uh, that, that uh, vendor has. Um, Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, just very, very quickly, the kill chain. So this is just a way of uh, expressing what happens during an attack. Um, and um, basically, the, the stages are you, you deliver um, um, the, the, the malware that uh, will have code in it that can exploit a vulnerability uh, on one of the systems. Um, this, that will install usually a Trojan horse, so um, some piece of software that communicates out to a command and control center. And, and that, from that stage, it's important to realize that uh, most malware doesn't do things by itself. Once it gets to the command and control center stage, um, then there is a real person at the other end somewhere actually directing the movement and directing the operations of the malware. So, you know, whether it be key logging, screen capture, password cracking, um, deciding which, which machine to, uh, which server to, to infect na next, that's all controlled by humans typically. Um, and then once you get to the target machine, you can actually then um, 
initiate the, the cyberkinetic event. So whatever it is you want to do, open up valves, uh, let let tanks overflow, whatever that might be. Um, that uh, that kill chain um, is is pretty much prevalent in every single uh, attack that we see. And then um, if you just uh, click the next button on this slide. Um, look, Cisco uh, yeah, has a whole bunch of solutions uh, that looks at each stage of the kill chain and actually uh, protects against it. So yeah, as we said before, most email, most uh, malware comes in through uh, you know, email or through visiting um, specific websites. And uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of products that we have um, that deal with those. The, the, the real point of this slide is just to kind of give you an idea of where it is in this kill chain that, so I've got the old name here, it's it's uh, OT Insights, what, uh, what, we, what we used to call Secure Ops until recently, we now call OT Insights. Um, and, uh, those those are really much at the installation, the command, the command control, and then the actual action stage of the uh, of the attack. So that's that's really just setting up to explain where, where OT Insights comes into, uh, comes into play. If we go to the next slide, I'll actually get into the solution itself now. Um, so uh, again, it says Secure Ops. We're now calling it OT Insights. Um, what 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 this shows is um, it's a hub and spoke arrangement. So we have this notion of a secure center, um, and that normally gets deployed at the customer's uh, data center or a customer uh, one of the customer's data centers. Um, it communicates over encrypted uh, links with the uh, with a number of secure sites. So, if you can imagine an oil and gas company, for example, they might have uh, FPSOs floating in the sea. They might have refineries. They might have offshore platforms. Each of those major sites would be con considered to be a secure site, and that would communicate back to this data center, the secure center. And sec secure also OT insights is not uh, a cloud-delivered service uh, at the moment. Um, it's an on-prem solution. Um, partly uh, the reasoning for that is customers are very sensitive about um, where data associated with industrial control system goes. So this, this gives them an opportunity to keep it within the company. Um, in terms of um, you know, what, what, what's actually deployed at these locations, if you just click the slide, please. Um, the um, it's it's really just a UCS server, so it's a Cisco server. It's an ASA firewall with some switching, um, and it's that's what we have at each secure site. At the secure center, we have uh, two lots of that equipment uh, for added availability, um, and uh, we also have, which isn't shown on here, we also have a very small form factor. So we we actually have a, one of our um, industrial uh, routers. Um, that can also run the software, and the advantage for that is, is is that we can deploy this at some very low, very small locations, so very small pumping stations or compressor sites, um, or oil fields. Um, so places places where a, a full server wouldn't make sense. Um, the, the the important thing about the solution in terms of the technology is not really the hardware. The hardware, as I've, sh as I've shown, is relatively straightforward. Um, it's the software that actually sits on that. Um, and the uh, the software uh, really uh, is, is comes in, comes in three three elements. There's the uh, asset visibility and malware detection module. There's the uh, compliance uh, monitoring module and secure remote access. And um, customers don't need to select all of these. It's possible if they just want secure remote access, they can just go for that module. Um, if they do want uh, compliance monitoring and reporting. Um, then that does need to be that does need to come with uh, the asset vis visibility module. But there is a certain amount of flexibility there in terms of module selected. Um, asset visibility. Uh, so how does this work? What is it? Uh, what it, so during asset visibility or to, to to identify the assets deployed with an industrial control system, what we do is we actually monitor all the traffic on that network, all on the industrial control system network. Um, important to say we monitor only. We do not probe. Don't ping. We do not scan. Um, for um, for industrial control systems um, to to um, 
can, can be very, very sensitive to external probing. Um, it can interfere with their operation. And because these systems are controlling potentially dangerous processes, uh, it, makes, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to, to actually do anything that could interfere with what's actually happening on the network. So we, we do this passive monitoring. We do packet capture. And then what we do is we do deep packet inspection to allow us to look inside um, inside the payload to actually understand what, what, what's actually being discussed between the units. Now, by doing this, what this allows us to do is to, to actually identify the make, model, serial number, and firmware of the various assets within the industrial control system. Um, and I'll explain why that's so important in a second. There is actually, uh, in the compliance package, which is an optional, optional package, there is this ability to switch on some asset, active asset detection. But this doesn't go down to the control level where it could cause harm. This stays very much at the workstation uh, server level. And what that allows us to do then is to use um, WMI to actually interrogate the Windows machines to actually detect the level of operating, you know, what version of operating system is installed, what patches have been installed, um, is there an antivirus engine running on it, and what, what are the signatures, are there delayed the signatures so we can do a compliance report. So primarily it's passive and at the, at the control level only passive, and then at, uh, at the higher levels we, we can switch on some active asset detection. Why is that important? Really important because uh, unless you understand what assets you have in an industrial control system, you're really blind to understanding what vulnerabilities you have. So here's an example. The Department of Homeland Security issues out these ICS CERT advisories. So that's in, uh, Industrial Control System Cyber Emergency Response Team advisories. And they send them out daily or weekly. Um, as they discover vulnerabilities within industrial control systems. So you'll see this one um, is actually um, a, for a Rockwell automation, Micrologic 1400 um, device. Um, and it's a you know, credential vulnerability. What it says basically is that this device will allow arbitrary code to be run within the industrial control system. Now, for a lot of customers, um, they don't understand or they don't know what devices they have installed in the field. And, and you know, to give an example, I was talking to um, an oil and gas company. They've got 110 offshore assets um, around the world. Um, and they get these uh, advisories on a daily basis, weekly basis. And typically, they don't know if, if it applies to them. They, they send the advisories out to their field offices. They ask the field offices to report back as to whether or not uh, they've got any of these vulnerable devices. Typically, the uh, the field office either says we have no idea, or they just don't respond at all. So, so, so virtually all all industrial uh, operators and industrial control systems have this big problem. They don't know what they've got in the field. They may know that they've got a DCS system by ABB, for example, or they might know that they've got you know Rockwell PLC somewhere, and they might even know what roughly what series the PLCs are. Um, unfortunately, they won't know exactly what make, what uh, firmware version they're running, or what serial numbers of the, they're running. So that, that's that's a that's a huge problem. Um, so basically, they don't know if they're vulnerable or not. So this is why asset visibility is massively important, so virtually to all operators of uh, industrial control systems. Some do um, do manual uh, asset uh, collection, so where they actually send somebody around to to try to determine which version of uh, uh, firmware is installed on each of their controllers. But when you're talking about hundreds and sometimes thousands of controllers or even more, um, it's really hard to do that. And then because you have to remediate and change the firmware and upgrade the firmware when you find a vulnerability, then you've got the whole problem of checking. So again, this solution actually does it automatically, gives you uh, an up-to-date view of where you are uh, with all your assets all the time. Um, what uh, what we can also do is then cross-check that information, the make, the model, the, the, the serial number, with uh, with uh, asset uh, with uh, vulnerability databases. So NIST, so NIST have um, uh, these common vulnerability and exposure database, which is is basically uh, just a database of vulnerabilities associated with uh, devices, with uh, industrial control devices. 
uh, what this tool will actually do is it will actually allow, uh, will actually search the database and actually correlate what you actually have or what the customer has in their industrial control system with that database and will basically tell you that, hey, in your industrial control system on this site, you've got 22 vulnerable devices and, and you can see the CVEs and the little the short title of what the, uh, the, um, the actual CVE is relating to. Um, these are Rockwell ones, but you know they're, they're, they're there for every 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 make of um, of SCAD and DCS system. Um, so this will very easily explain to a, to a customer where, where they've got real real issues in their network. Okay, uh, moving on. Yeah. Now, what, as I said, the 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 ability to to um, to work out what make model firmware serial number um, you've, you've got in your uh, industrial control system is 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 uh, made it made possible by understanding the the, the actual conversations that are going on between the uh, the various elements in the industrial control system. And to do that, it's not simply good enough to um, understand that you know this controller is talking to that controller. We have to dive right in and look at the industrial protocol. Um, and because we know the protocol, we know we can see the information that's being passed between them, and that's where we get the information about make, model, firmware, etc. These are the uh, uh, the uh, protocols which are supported by the uh, by the, the solution at the moment between by OT Insights. Um, you have most of the protocols that you'll see in um, in oil and gas, electrical utilities, um, manufacturing. Um, the, the, there will be some protocols here uh, be, you know, used in the field that aren't here. Uh, what we do is where we find a protocol that we don't support, we, we simply write a new uh, protocol detection engine, um, and that takes two or three weeks. But you know, typically what we're finding is that you know, 80, 90 percent of the time uh, we don't have to do any, any protocol development. It, it, it's already available in the solution. But as I say, the list is growing all the time. Next slide, please. Okay, I, I, this is a, a, a slide. Uh, I'll just uh, again. Uh, I guess some of the people out there will, will know about Cisco Talus, but the the, the uh, I mentioned this in passing. There is a, a planned link between uh, Talos and uh, OT Insights. Um, what you might have noticed that advisory from the Department of Homeland Security that we had upon the screen before. Um, that uh, the information for that um, of, about that vulnerability actually came from Cisco Talus. So I just mentioned in passing, it's um, it's it's uh, it's actually not really a thing. It's it's a it's a, it's a bunch of things. So 600 uh, Cisco engineers uh, full time working to identify um, malware. Um, we leverage 150 million endpoints, so all our firewalls into the detection systems, uh, endpoint detection systems out there are also sending telemetry back to our Talos cloud. So we're, this allows us to scan um, 13 billion web requests per day. And bearing in mind, a lot of this malware is still transported by email. 35% um, of all the worldwide uh, email traffic, that's probably around about 40, 40 to 50% really, um, about 100 terabytes of data received each day. And what we do is we just get all this information. We have some very, uh, very clever people who um, will, will dissect uh, the malware. We also have machine learning uh, to help with that. We also use uh, a whole bunch of techniques to, uh, to try and encourage the malware to actually do something bad in the Talos cloud. So we'll actually run the malware making it look like it's inside an industrial control system, for example, and see what it does. And then once we find that, that there is a piece of software there that is definitely uh, uh, some, a form of malware, we, we will automatically update our endpoints to, to be on the lookout for it. And in the case of OT Insights, we can, we can uh, provide further information about vulnerabilities. Um, won't dwell on this too long, just to say uh, there is a technical side to deploying this. It's, um, you, you do have those servers and firewalls I was talking about before. Uh, one of the things that we need to do is to gather all the information from the existing industrial control system. Now, if 
the industrial control system uses uh, um, Cisco switches, then we can just simply switch on uh, something we call R-SPAN, um, and, and this will allow us to send all the traffic that's going through the switches back to the traffic monitoring uh, box. Um, in the case of uh, a network where there isn't um, Cisco switches or switches that can support R-SPAN, because I think Hirschman switches can also support, some of them can support R-SPAN, what we have to do sometimes is put probes on. Um, the other thing is there's some technical uh, issues with sometimes with up uplink utilization. So again, if there's already a lot of the, the, the links between the switches and the top of the, the aggregation switch is um, uh, very busy anyway, then we can put an overlay network. Won't dwell on that. There's a, there's a lot of technical. I mean, if there's some questions on that. It's fine. Um, this this slide just wants to explain that we, as well as looking at traffic uh, traveling over Ethernet links, um, we can also uh, monitor traffic on serial links. So a lot of industrial control systems, um, you know, have been put in over the last 20, 30 years. A lot of them still use serial communications. So maybe Modbus over RS485 or uh, or, or something like the DMP over over something similar, uh, RS422. What we can do is we can convert that serial uh, bus. So we use a tap, so we don't actually interfere with the actual communications, but we can uh, we can tap it, convert the serial data to Ethernet, and then uh, and then pass the traffic so that we can get the information out of the data, the flow um, as we do normally. So that was all about asset visibility. So number one, our, number one um, is is uh, is, is uh, um, functional module is, is is really asset visibility, and I'll explain why that's important. The next thing we do is malware detection, um, and um, what we do here is because we're already picking up all that information about what's being communicated from one device to another device in the industrial control system. Um, we can actually start to baseline those communications and then look for deviations. So what does this mean? So in, in a, in, to, to give an example, you may have two controllers that need to talk to each other. You know, one might be picking up a level, the other one might be opening a valve. Um, and, for the, um, and, and to operate uh, the, the plant, they need to talk together. So the first controller might be writing to certain registers and the second controller. Um, and during a learning period, when we put the system in learning mode, which is usually for two or three weeks when the system first goes in, um, it will understand what those conversations look like. Um, and um, it, will, it will make a note, it will baseline it. Now, if that controller at some later stage starts writing to a different register or reading from a different register in, that, in, the, in, in control B, um, then that's a deviation. That's never been seen before. So when that happens, we alert the operator and say, "Hey, look, something's something's changed in this uh, in the way that these devices are talking to each other." Now it could be that uh, the operators themselves have uh, reconfigured the plant and have decided the plant should operate in a slightly different way. In which case, the operator will say, "Yeah, I, I knew that was going to happen. That's fine. I'll accept it." Um, there is also the possibility that if they haven't changed um, the way the plant operates, then it's malware that's that's actually making those changes, and it's malware that's actually causing that communication to act the way it's communicating. So, um, so this is how we can detect malware. It doesn't require anyone to enter any data. It's simply you plug the solution in, it listens, it learns what good looks like, and then after two or three weeks, we turn it into detection mode, and it will look for, for deviations. Anomalous behavior detection. Um, it will also look not just at the communications, but the frequency of communications, um, as well as um, as well as anomalous behavior detection. We also have heuristics. So we're also looking um, for things that are we know to be bad in industrial control systems. So we'll be looking for things like man in the middle attacks, um, looking for malformed packets, looking for um, uh, attacks, uh, known attacks that use uh, SYN or FIN uh, type messages. So telltale signs that people are trying to uh, trying to do something bad in the network. Um, so using a combination of those techniques, uh, we were able to uh, to detect malware. Can't stop malware. Must stress again, this is this solution is not to stop malware. You use firewalls, intruder detection systems, advanced malware protection. 
and other techniques, uh, web web uh, uh, web uh, security appliances, mail security appliances, uh, to try and stop the, the 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 malware getting into this system. What OT Insider Secure Ops is doing is it's trying to uh, detect this very very stealthy software that we I spoke about at the beginning. Um, um, one thing I should mention, um, the, what, because we're looking at these uh, these um, right into payload and looking at uh, uh, what's happening in, at the protocol level, the industrial protocol level, we also get a whole bunch of information about uh, operational stability. So we'll actually find, and this is very common when we deploy this, we'll find operational issues. So we might find um, we have a device that's trying to communicate with another device that no longer exists, um, and they're called ghost devices, and, and they can cause instability. So not a cyber uh, instability, but, but an operational instability. Um, we can also find uh, uh, networking issues as well. So we'll find that um, as far as the operator is concerned, uh, the system is running fine. Uh, the reality is that packets are being dropped between, say, two or three controllers. Um, and it might be just on the edge of being very unstable. So again, we can highlight those sort of uh, those sort of uh, issues as well. So as well as the cyber protection, which is the, the 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 real focus of the solution, there is a huge advantage in terms of operational stability. Um, secure remote access. This is uh, the third module really talking about here. Um, and what it does is it it uh, it forms a single entry point for third parties wanting to get access to the uh, industrial control networks. So typically, if for example, there's a give an example a, 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 a company that supplied compressors for offshore platforms. Um, so you have these compressors on each of the platforms. There may be a need for them to get in and remotely look at those compressors because it's so expensive to fly someone out to the platform to do it. Or when they do fly out, they want to make sure they've got all the right tools. Um, also, there may be a, an opportunity to actually correct the problem without flying out, providing they've got this remote access. So what this, the remote access portion of the solution does is it, it provides that facility um, and what it does it in a very controlled way. So if there is, and we'll say it's a, a compressor uh, supplier, the compressor supplier wants to get into a particular site. So what they'll do is they'll go to a portal, um, they'll sign on using log, you know, pass, pass, username and password, and that will give you them access to, to the uh, secure remote access portal. What they'll do then is they'll see the things they're allowed to talk to. So they'll, for each site, it will say you're allowed to talk to this uh, this uh, engineering workstation or this controller, uh, and they can select what it is they want to talk to. But what they can, but what they um, can't do at this stage is get automatic connection to it. They request connection, and then the customer can then look at the request and to say, okay, I'll allow you to have access to this uh, controller on this network uh, only between the hours of 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock. Uh, because that's the time I'm happy for you to be doing something with that, you know, with that compressor. Um, at that stage, the, uh, the 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 compressor supplier can actually then um, get access all the way down into that site, onto that that controller, and actually start configuring it. Whilst he's doing that, and if it's if it's a, if it's a controller, it's probably a secure shell session. If it's a, if it's a, if he's contacting a, a, an engineering workstation, for example. Um, he'll probably have a Windows machine and he'll be uh, clicking on things and updating various scripts. Um, as he's doing that, uh, the solution will actually show the customer what that compressor supplier is doing. So every time he moves his mouse, the solution will show exactly what where, where the mouse has moved um, on, on the uh, plant manager's window. Um, if he clicks on something, again, he, he'll see it being clicked. Now, the reality is uh, plant managers probably have other things to do, so they're probably not going to watch every session to see what the person is doing. Uh, so what the system also does is actually records the session visually, so it produces a video, um, and then it's uh, possible, uh, especially if an incident occurs, and, and, and the question is what was happening when that incident occurred, it allows for a playback of that video, so you can see at the time the incident occurred, who was doing what inside the uh, the networks. Um, and in this case, you'd be able to see the 
you know, the uh, compressor supplier may be uh, changing a configuration on one of their controllers, and maybe maybe that was the uh, the action that caused caused the incident to happen. Um, so very powerful. What happens is it first of all it does it reduces the amount of time the system, the network is open, um, which which um, always reduces the sort of threat plane. Um, what it also does is it discourages people from uh, going in and making small changes that are undocumented. So again, we have the cyber uh, cyber uh, side of the solution, uh, which is restricting the access, uh, making sure all access is authorized and, and audited. But we also have this uh, ability to uh, add stability, operational stability by uh, making sure that people aren't doing small changes without without the proper uh, procedures being in place and certainly for one of our customers in the US uh, in fact the largest refinery in the US their, their comment was that this is this has already caused um, uh, all these unscheduled changes to the control system to stop happening so although they've always had uh, very strict um, uh, procedures in place to make changes on the network the reality was people were making small changes not documenting them and not requesting uh, work orders to actually carry out those changes for good reasons they just wanted to get the thing working again but it did mean that there was a bunch of undocumented changes and that also is now being reduced endpoint um, oh so this is compliance so with the compliance module and this again is an optional module uh, what we do here is we um, we look at the windows machines and we check to see what patches have been loaded onto the machine um, we also look at what uh, antivirus engine endpoint engine is, is running and, and what uh, antivirus signatures are loaded and we compare that with a list that's supplied normally by uh, the main automation contractor if there is one so if there is a site and say abb are the main automation contractor they'll they'll have a, a list of patches and antivirus signatures um, that they will have tested in the lab and they're called qualified patch lists they supply the qualified patch list and we we cross check what's actually deployed in in the industrial control system with that patch list and then we give a simple traffic light um, indication of, of what's happening um, so red means yep you've got you've got patches that have not been installed green you know, you're, you're good to go um, so so a, a good example of this would be uh, WannaCry. So WannaCry was um, an exploit, uh, or using an exploit called Eternal Blue, which exploited uh, a vulnerability in a in a in a SMB in, in in one of the main protocols used within Windows systems, uh, the SMB block SMB message, SMB version one. So there was a patch available. Uh, for many versions of uh, Windows that had been out there for months uh, and a lot of customers just had not done anything about it, hadn't realized that they had to do something about it. Uh, this gives a really simple way of saying this would have shown uh, the customers and it will, will have done saying, hey, Red, you've got to update your server um, to, to, to deal with that. As soon as you've updated it to SMB version 2, you are no longer vulnerable to that attack. So uh, compliance um, it's still a very uh, popular module with with a lot of our customers, um, and it's actually one of the one of the modules that we first created when we first started the solution. Um, really, this this slide is just to explain that um, secure ops or um, OT Insights, as it's now called. I should explain, by the way, we've just changed the name from Secure Ops to OT Insights. The reason being is Secure Ops sounds like it's all about security. OT Insights is, is meant to uh, explain that it's not just security, but it has this operational uh, side to it as well. Um, but it is is provided as a service, supplied as a service, um, and we have um, well we have three main uh, tiers. I've got two of them shown here. One is is uh, Cisco managed, and this is where we basically do everything to make sure the service is up and running. So we we deploy it, uh, we keep it up to date. Uh, when, when there's new software, we test that software, deploy it. Um, we uh, proactively monitor the solution. Um, if anything fails, the hardware or software, we will try to fix it remotely. Um, if we can't do that, we'll fix it locally. Um, but basically, we take we we take on service level um, 
um, uh, agreements or we'll, there'll be service level agreements in place that says we'll keep this service up and running um, for you know with a four hour response time or whatever. Um, the customer managed is is basically gives off uh, gives over a, a lot more um, responsibility to the customer. So if they have the in-house capability and the resources, then um, then they can take over. So for example, um, a lot of customers use Red Hat Linux, and we use Red Hat Linux in our solution. If they're comfortable with dealing with Red Hat and, and, and looking after that element of the solution, then we can say, okay, at a re to reduce your uh, service, your day two uh, operating costs, um, you look after Red Hat Linux, and we'll look after the rest of the solution. And it's there is a lot of flexibility in here, and for partners, um, you know, there's an opportunity here as well. So. If, if, for example, the uh, the uh, 24 by 7 uh, service desk um, is something that you know a partner wants to support, then then that's fine. Will 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 you know level one service desk can be run by the partner, and then they can uh, they can leverage the level two and level three service desks uh, for each of the modules um, and each of the, the the pieces of software. Um, after that, so again. You know, there was a time when we supplied the solution and we did everything every time. We don't do that anymore. We do. We, there is a lot of flexibility, and we, you know, we're trying to encourage partners to take over some of those responsibilities. Okay, I think that's yeah, that's the end of the slide deck. Um, I guess are we ready to uh, start taking some questions? Thank you, Paul. Uh, we don't have any open questions. Uh, let's open the session for live Q&A now. Uh, you can post your questions in the Q&A panel, or you can also use the raise hand option, and I can admit you to speak out with your questions. Thank you. Paul, I don't see any questions coming in. Uh, do you have anything to add, or uh, we can wrap up the session? Um, what I might do? How, how many? How many minutes have we got? Um, uh, we're a little over the time, actually. <laughs> oh right, okay. Well, so, apologies for that. We did. <laughs> okay, different time zone. Um, yeah, look, I, yeah, there's a few other slides I can talk about, but if we're over the time, yeah, if there's, yeah. I, it's probably better that I don't share anything else, and just if, if there are any questions, answer those. Otherwise, close the session down. So, so just before you close, I mean, just one of the things I wanted to call out, Paul. I mean, thanks a lot for your session, and thanks a lot for connecting up from UK, which is middle of the night for you. But just in terms of where we go with this, so I just wanted the, the you know, everybody on the call to know, you know, in terms of call to action, how do we identify the opportunities that we have in the market, and, and what would be the next steps? So typically, you know, anyone who's got industrial control systems, whether they're oil and gas customers or utilities, uh, manufacturing plants, uh, you know, typically the best way to engage with those customers is for us to go out and do a, a proof of concept, right? So we've got this mini server that we can go out and we can actually demonstrate. They can actually see what it looks like in real life. Um, you know, there's no other platform at the, at the moment on the market which offers everything that we have around um, OT insights. Right, so everything around the asset visibility and capability, um, everything around the secure remote access, uh, you know, the whole thing around security incident response capability for industrial control systems using deep packet inspection and providing it as a service essentially is um, you know, one of a kind. Uh, you know, there's no one out there who's competing. There might be some companies that do one part of that, but holistically to look at how we can structure all that together and work with our partners to deliver that solution, there's really no one out there. And, and you know, we're open to discussions with some of the other partners around what we can do potentially white labeling it um, or working out some form of matrix of you know who does what. So if you've got customers out there that, that have this and you want to offer it as a service, I mean, let's sit down and let's talk about um, how we can do that and how we can potentially um, wrap around partner services around what we do from a Cisco standpoint and then go to market around that. So I just wanted to call that out. I, I'm aware we're, we're over time. Um, so the slides will be shared, um, contact details as well in terms of if you want to find out more information around this. Um, and if we've got any potential customers that we need to demonstrate this for, then you know, we're ready to, to send out um, a team to do that.
thank you Ali and uh, Paul and thanks again everyone for attending today's session. Uh, as mentioned, uh, the recording and the deck will be shared to you by email within a few days. Just a quick reminder, once you end the session, a short survey will automatically pop up on your screen. We appreciate if you could spare a minute and fill out the short survey to let us know your experience. Thanks again and have a good day ahead. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you.